<coughs> Sorry. Should I just share my screen? Recording in progress. So the next speaker is is a zoo from UC Irvine and is going to talk about non-backtracking spectral clustering. Isa, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. It's very nice to be here and thanks for the invitation. I really enjoy all the topic, all the nice talk and posters in this conference. Today I'm going to talk about the joint work with Ludovic Stefan from EPFL. He's also in the audience. Uh, we'll talk about special clustering problem in sparse random hypergraphs. So first of all, hypergraph is a classical object in combinatorics and theoretical computer science. Um, it's just a slight generalization of graph. So instead of having vertex set and edge set, we have a hyper edge set. On the left hand side, uh, we can have seven vertices and different color of the um, <coughs> set is a hyper edge. You could have hyper edge of size one, two, three. And on the right hand side, I, I give you a reason that hypergraph is useful because it could be used to model some higher order relation among data. On the right hand side, this is our students taking different classes as every hyper edge will be a, hyper, will be a class. <coughs> so every student taking different class will sharing different hyper edges. And from there you could have some sort of inference, where are they from? And students taking information theory, linear algebra, algorithm, they might come from a department and the right hand side, general psychology or British fiction, they might come from a different uh, <coughs> department. So based on those data, you could inference some community information. Okay, why uh, this is interesting, so recent years, uh, people already start to look at higher order network as a generalization of graph network. So we already know graph networks are really good at modeling pairwise interaction. Then if you want to do more, uh, we should take into account the higher order interaction. So there's a lot of research going on to study tensor method beyond matrix model. Also some uh, simplicial complexes representation. And today we'll focus on a hypergraph representation of this higher order network. In general, in network analysis, one of the fundamental questions is about community detection. It is a real studied object in, in the graph model. So to study the um, algorithm on any graph model, the, it is used to be a, usually it's an NP-hard problem. So you want to put a probability measure on your data and to study average behavior of your uh, community detection algorithm. The most Fundamental one is the called stochastic block model introduced by Holland et al. in 1983. The simplest version is the following. We consider unknown partition of the graph into two communities of equal size. And then we generate edge between vertices depending on their community structure. If two vertex are in the same community, you generate the edge with probability P. Otherwise, another probability Q less than P, you generate the edge across communities. The task will be you sample a graph from this stochastic block model, and you run your favorite algorithm to find the unknown partition. But here we want to require a high probability answer with efficient and accurate algorithm. Okay. The simplest way to study this model and its connection to random matrix is the spectral method on the adjacency matrix. Um, if we write down all the information in this random graph, it will be a Bernoulli random matrix where AIJ is an independent Bernoulli random variable with par parameter P or Q, depending on the location of the entry. So if we, if we write down the expectation matrix, it will just be a two block matrix with P on the main block and Q on the <laughs> off diagonal block. And the eigenvalue tells you the information of, of this network. Number one is the average degree. Number two tells you the discrepancy between P and Q. The eigenvector also gives you information. The first eigenvalue is all one because 
every row sum is exactly the same. Second eigenvector tells you exact um, membership of different vertices. So the problem essentially is a inference problem. You have a random matrix A, but we can decompose it as expectation plus a noise term A minus expectation A. So the question becomes, how do you reinference the low rank structure from the noise? But right now, this is not a Gaussian noise, it's a sparse matrix noise. So the question, if we have a concentration result, if we know A is concentrated around its expectation, then you can do some sort of perturbation analysis to say the second eigenvector is close to the expectation. That means if we can observe the adjacency matrix A and you do the second eigenvector calculation, you can use the sign of the eigenvector to recover the community. <laughs> but this is true in, in the relatively dense model, so we know the concentration of the adjacency matrix would hold if the average degree is <laughs> at least logarithmic. In that case, you do some perturbation analysis like davis kahan inequality, then we can show that all but, but little one fraction of vertices can be correctly classified. So this is fits in the setup of sparse random matrices. There are a lot of work still going on to understand in different sparsity regime what is the behavior of your eigenvalue and eigenvectors. But the question is, a more important regime is when we look at random graph with bounded expected degree. And now, if we want to try to do the same argument, calculate the second eigenvector, you will not see the right answer that will be the partition between red and blue vertices. Instead, your second eigenvector will output some high degree vertices. This is the phenomenon called eigenvector localization in sparse random matrices. Basically, the second eigenvector, the most of the mass of the second eigenvector will be located at high degree vertices. So the second eigenvector tells you who are the popular people in the network, but not the global partition of the network. Uh, this is the fundamental question. Uh, so instead of looking at a GCC matrix, there has been a lot of development to do other method to reach the detection threshold. So what is, what is the sparse stochastic block model setting? The simplest case is still we consider a community partition of equal size. So you can think about sigma is a label function that gives every vertex label one or minus one, depending on their community. And you have parameter P equals A over N, Q equals B over N. There is a conjectured detection threshold. Uh, you can do detection, which means strictly better than random guess, if and only if AB satisfy the inequality, which is called the Kasten Stigum threshold. This conjecture was first proposed by Dezella et al. Uh, in 2011. Then following this conjecture, Moselle Lehman slide proof this is the if and only if statement. So above the threshold, there's some algorithm. Below the threshold, there's some information theoretical impossibility result showing no any algorithm could perform better than random guess. And, and also Moselle uh, Lohan Masuli and the Borden of the large Masuli, they come up with different algorithm. Um, all, they all reach this detection threshold. And today I want to mention the particular spectral method, which is not based on the eigenvector information about adjacency matrix, but based on this so-called non-backtracking operator. Okay, so this is a operator that's defined on the set of oriented edges. <coughs> so if we count the number of edges in the graph, you put two directions, then the oriented set will be twice as big as the edge set. Then the non-backtracking operator is defined on this oriented edge set in the following way. If uv is an oriented edge, xy is another oriented edge, and you can go from u to v, which is x, then x goes to y without making a backtrack walk, then you put a one in this matrix, otherwise it's zero. So this non-backtracking relation is not Hermitian that makes this operator non-Hermitian. Uh, in recent years, this non-backtracking operator is a very important ingredient to analyze sparse random matrices. 
So there are many works based on different model, ra random regular graph, random regular bipartite graph, inhomogeneous search training graph. They all rely on this operator. Okay, so what's the relation between SBM and this uh, operator? If you plot the eigenvalue distribution of this operator, <coughs> and the result in border of the large Masulia shows that if the parameter regime is above the threshold, with high probability, you will see this phenomenon. The outlier in the spectrum gives you the information of average degree, which is A plus B over two, and discrepancy between A and B. And the rest of eigenvalue are confined in a circle of radius square root A plus B over two. So we already see the outlier, and you can compute the eigenvector associated with those outlier, and you can use those eigenvector to detect your true label sigma, okay? So the message here is, in this regime, using special method on the adjacency matrix will fail, but using our eigenvector information on this non-backtracking operator will work down to the optimum information threshold. Okay. So now we want to uh, move to higher dimension to look at higher order network. A natural generalization of this stochastic block model is this so-called hypergraph stochastic block model. Instead of generating edges, we want to generate hyperedges independently, and the probability will depend on the membership. So the simplest way is we still assign membership to every vertex with minus one or plus one, and every hyperedge appears independently with certain probability, and the probability will depend on your membership. So on the right-hand side, if the color of the vertices are all blue or all red, you generate it with a probability P. And then across community, you have another parameter Q, which is smaller than P. So this models some sort of um, high order correlation. And you can imagine this is a uh, co-author network. People on the left-hand side could be mathematician, on the right-hand side could be a physicist, and every hyper edge could represent a archive paper that they wrote together, and the question is you observe those collaborations and you want to inference what's their department, okay? And the question is we want to construct a label estimator that's better than random guess, but I don't care whether you put a one or minus one correctly, so you can guess every mathematician wrong, every physician wrong, but that's still a perfect answer, okay? This is an interesting question that got a lot of attention in uh, statistics, electrical engineering, theoretical computer science in recent years. But most of the results so far focus on the regime where the expected degree is growing with n. So that's not a nice model to look at realistic network. So here we want to focus on the case where the average degree is fixed. <coughs> okay. So one a quick way to uh, store all the information is to look at tensors. Here, if you want to write down all the hyperarchy information, a matrix is not enough, so you need a higher order tensor such that the tensor will take value one if I want to IQ form a hyperarchy. So for order three tensor, that could represent a three uniform hypergraph. The bad news is uh, there are a lot of tensor computation problem that are NP hard. Instead, you can do some sort of tensor unfolding or higher order singular value decomposition. So there are some work based on tensor methods, uh, which is not NP hard, but so far there's no result below a uh, growing degree regime. Okay, so that's a, so directly apply tensor method might not be enough to go to the bounded degree regime. And here we wanna, <coughs> study this more challenging regime with a very general model. So consider a order Q tensor, means, which means every hyper edge is, the same, is, the, is of size Q. And we have a probability parameter set that's given by a tensor. And I can generate hyper edge of size Q uh, with probability P sigma E divided by the scaling N choose Q minus one. So that make my expected degree of order one for every vertex. And this probability P sigma E will depend on the membership of my vertices inside this hyper edge. So it's not 
just two value, you can have a lot of parameter to describe this model. And we don't assume the number of, of um, vertices in each community is the same. So you could have general proportion of each type. But there's a regularization assumption that we assume every vertex has the same expected degree, D. Otherwise, this becomes a much easier problem. You can count degree to classify different groups, okay? <coughs> and so, so in this case, there's also a conjectured kasten stigum threshold, uh, which, which can be stated in terms of the adjacency matrix. So now the adjacency matrix will be a matrix that take value in integers, not just zero one value, where AIJ counts the number of hyperedges containing I and J. And you can compute the eigenvalue of this adjacent matrix. The first one must be D, and if you have R blocks, there are R many eigenvalues. The keston stigum threshold can be stated as um, the following. If you take R0 to be the number of informative eigenvalues below, uh, above this threshold D, which means you take eigenvalue squared times Q minus one, if it's above D, then there should be an algorithm to detect R0 many communities. This is the conjecture stated by Angelili, Katagorini, Zakala, Zebarova. They conjecture above the detection threshold, the belief propagation algorithm would work, and they also propose a special method based on the non-backtracking operator, which I will define in the next slides. Okay, so we already know how to define non-backtracking operator on graph, which is defined on the set of oriented edges. Now it gets trickier to define oriented hyper edge because every hyper edge, there are Q vertices and you could put Q directions in the following way. So you pick a vertex V and you take a direction V to the hyper edge E. So altogether you have Q choices. And then the number of tracking operator is defined by those oriented hyper edges in a similar fashion, if I can go from U to the hyperedge E and land at a vertex V and jump outside E to another hyperedge F, then you put a one. Otherwise, you put a zero. So the right-hand side is a backtracking walk. I start from U, go to the hyperedge E, and I come back to V and take E again. That's not allowed. Okay, so this makes this operator non-permission. Our first result is a characterization of the spectrum for this operator. So remember R0 is the number of eigenvalue that's above this keston stigum threshold. So those eigenvalue can be seen outside the bulk of this operator spectrum. And for the rest of eigenvalue below the information threshold, they are confined in, the, in a ball of radius square root Q minus one times D. So in the simulation, we have a stochastic block model with four blocks, and you see uh, the first eigenvalue is around average degree times Q minus one, and the other three eigenvalues are around the, the, the predict location, and the rest of eigenvalue are inside this disk. Okay. However, if we count the number of uh, hyper edges, is roughly like Q times D times N. So even though it is an order N size, if I have a large parameter Q and a D, this could be still a large matrix. There is a, a nice way to do a dimension reduction to make this problem in a smaller size. So we can define a 2N by 2N matrix B tilde that form a two block structure where you need to calculate D, which is the diagonal degree matrix, and A, which is the adjacency matrix we defined before. It turns out that there's a nice connection between the uh, number tracking operator B and this operator B tilde by the following Iharabas formula. So this formula tells you the eigenvalue of B, which is recorded in the characteristic polynomial, can be factored as some trivial eigenvalue, either one or minus Q minus one, and eigenvalues of B tilde. So if we care about informative eigenvalues, we can just compute eigenvalues of B tilde. That makes our problem easier. Okay. And okay, so this um, Iharabas formula was discovered in 1992 by Bass for, for graphs, and we generalized it to 
hypergraph. Okay. So uh, instead of calculating eigenvalues, we care more about eigenvectors because eigenvectors should give us an approximate answer of the signal. So we can also perform an eigenvector analysis of this reduced operator B tilde in the following ways. So we calc you calculate the ith eigenvector of B tilde, which is a 2n dimensional vector, but you take the last n entries and normalize it to be a um, unit vector. Then with high probability, this eigenvector will be positively correlated with the true signal eigenvector from the expected, expected matrix A. And the overlap can be calculated explicitly depending on this signal to noise ratio tau. Okay. And this gives a way to quantify the correlation between the true signal and eigenvectors of B tilde. And there's a standard way to go from eigenvector overlap to a guarantee of a spectral algorithm. Okay. So in the picture, we draw a three block model where um, you, you use the eigenvector, the second and the vector and third eigenvector of B tilde to classify those three clusters. So you, you can see a strong correlation between the true label and our eigenvector information. Okay, so let me uh, uh, tell a little bit about the proof idea. So there are two ingredients in this proof. The first one is about uh, a random hypergraph uh, structure. So usually in this very sparse graph regime, you can always do a local tree approximation to reduce your graph problem to a Galton Watson tree. And here, since we have a higher order structure, it is a hypergraph, you need to build a random hypertree analog of a uh, Galton Watson tree and do some sort of local approximation. The idea is you can generate a Galton Watson tree with labels in the following way. You start with a root with a certain spin and you generate Poisson many hyper edges and you assign labels with certain probability and you propagate this hyper tree. And that gives you a good approximation about the geometry of this hypergraph. From there, you can calculate eigenvector information on the tree and do approximation to get a good understanding of top eigenvalue and eigenvectors of my hypergraph. So this is the random hypergraph part. Another part is the random matrix part. We want to show that the rest of eigenvalue are confined in this circle. So we need to apply some moment method, but instead of taking a fixed power, you need to take a high power at the level of log n. The idea is to take the, the, the high power of this non-backtracking matrix will count the number of non-backtracking walk of that L in this hypergraph. So we apply high moment method to this matrix, but not exactly B. You need to do some modification to get rid of the expectation. So you need to center this B in a certain way. And then it becomes a counting problem. How do you count such work in this hypergraph? But there's another convenient way to see those work by, by doing a bijection. So you can look at a hypergraph um, configuration on the left, and you do a bipartite representation we put vertices on the one hand and hyper edges on the right hand side. Then you can draw edges in between. This gives a way to translate non-backtracking work on hypergraph to non-backtracking work on bipartite graph, and we do the counting on the bipartite graph level. That gives you a good understanding of the spectral radius. So that's the structure of the proof. Okay, so um, the take home message here is that even this is a sparse random tensor problem, but for community detection in, in sparse random hypergraph, you can reduce it to an eigenvector problem of a 2n by 2n non Hermitian matrix constructed by the adjacency matrix A and degree matrix D. And we show that it works down to the conjecture the generalized Keston Sigum threshold. And the next step is to make it more realistic by just not just looking at uniform hypergraph, but taking into account all higher order relation in this data set. That will be a non-uniform hypergraph. And there are some partial results in this direction after our work. Uh, this uh, Choder et al, they show a ihar bass formula for non-uniform hypergraph, but the probability analysis is more challenging and it's not um, 
cover yet. And there's another interesting problem is about this impossibility result below this threshold. So we use random matrix techniques to show that there's a way to reach the detection threshold, but the impossibility result you want to show there's no any other algorithm, even with exponential running time, that could uh, gain any information below the threshold. And another interesting question is to see where is the computational to statistical gap in this model. So it's different from spike tensor model that we can we can have a very sparse regime with a weak signal, you could still get a non-trivial correlation, but maybe you can do some other tensor method even below this threshold, we don't know. So that's an interesting question to, to look at. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Questions? Okay, so I'll break the ice. Um, do you have any other thoughts on the computational to statistical gaps? Like, for example, there has been a fair amount of work uh, recently in the past, say, three, four years, that tries to deduce a web of reduction between problems. And typically, true pro prototypical problems are hidden clique and sparse PCA. So do you think that, for example, it's reasonable to expect that there will be an average case reduction from this uh, spectral hypergraph problems to others? Okay, so there's a, a quite different behavior of this hypergraph stochastic bulk model and tensor PCA. So in the tensor PCA case, if you, have, if you want to have polynomial algorithm, the signal must diverge with n. But the information threshold was, con was proved at a constant level. And here we s you see our algorithm already work in the bounded degree regime. So if there's a gap, though, it's only a constant gap because if the hypergraph is below the connectivity threshold, definitely there's no giant component, there's no way you can get any information. So if there's a gap, they only differ by a constant. So that makes a difference between this problem and tensor PCA. But I wonder if like, even at a constant level, there's another gap by using NP-hard tensor method. Other questions? Easy. Um, you saw this uh, dimension reduction matrix, B tilde. Uh, can, you, can you explain a little bit or give some intuition of where, where this is coming from? I, I haven't seen this before. Okay, so this is coming from the first um, few work on this. Um, it, this is a deterministic formula. The first few work is coming from number theorists and uh, combinatorists. The idea is you can factor this matrix, number tracking matrix B in a certain way. And you do this determinantal formula trick, like determinant of A B and B A are differ, yeah, differ by some uh, trivial eigenvalues. So by doing that, you kind of reduce the dimension. So it's hidden in the proof, but that's the main idea. Any other questions? And if not, let's thank both the speakers again. Thank you.